Hey everyone, it's Monday, last week of school, huh? Um, it's a long, hot weekend. Hope everyone got outside. You can see right here, I got some sunburn, I got some windburn. My nose is all red already. So, did a lot of fishing, a lot of biking this weekend. Hope you guys got a chance to get outside too. Um, I'm not sure if you've been fishing or not, but if you have, uh, I found that the walleyes are finally starting to uh, bite and soar the crappies. So, um, last week of school, this week, um, all the work needs to be done by this Friday. Uh, that includes your AR goals and your book report for Miss Aiken. Um, if you need some uh, some extra points, hopefully we'll have this book completed by Friday and you can take an AR test on that also. Becca asked the other day, uh, hey Mr. D, uh, how many chapters are there left in the book? Um, well, I just counted and Becca and there are 15 chapters left. Um, that sounds like a lot, but some of the chapters are actually really short. There's a couple that are one page chapters, a couple that are like two pages, three pages. So they're short, quick chapters. Um, I will hopefully... I'll try to have this uh, completely finished be, uh, by now, between now and and Friday. If not, uh, if you're interested, I will continue to read the book uh, into next week or until it gets completed. Uh, just uh, tune in to Google Classroom like you have been doing for the last, uh, last two months or so. So, uh, I'm going to read a couple chapters to you today. Hopefully YouTube is cooperative today, gets them uploaded quickly, and I can get them onto Google Classroom for you. So, here we go. This chapter is called No Man's Land. American star shells exploded in the sky above Hideki. Designed not to kill, but to illuminate, the shells burst into bright glowing stars that hung from tiny parachutes. It took the star shells about a minute to hit the ground. And in that time, everything below them was lit up with a ghostly green light. For Hideki, it was like the Americans were lighting his way south, towards his sister. But it was also the way towards the dangerous front lines, where the Americans and the Japanese were still fighting. After a quick detour to pick up Ray's pack, Hideki had joined hundreds of Okinawan refugees walking in the same direction. He hoped the Americans would let him pass through safely with the refugees, and then he could press on farther south to find Kamiko. The Americans used illumination shells to watch for Japanese infiltrators at night. What the light showed Hideki and the other refugees were all the dead bodies around them. Some were Japanese, but most were Okinawan. They littered the muddy fields to each side and lay like stones in the road but Hideki had learned to not really see them and just to keep moving. Seeing them, really seeing them, was too much to bear. Hideki felt the skin on the back of his neck crawl, like the person behind him was breathing on him, and he spun. But the nearest person was four steps away. Hideki shivered and turned to walk again. Was it the ghost of Ray? The ghost of his father? It was hard to know. It could have been the ghost of any of the thousands of other people who had died on Okinawa since the fighting began. The reek of death was everywhere. Another star shell exploded in the sky, and Hideki looked down at his cold, sodden feet. He was just thinking that maybe he should have waited until the American doctor brought him back shoes. Excuse me. <coughs> the American doctor brought back shoes for him when he noticed the shoes underneath the kimono of the woman walking next to him. They weren't, weren't wooden sandals or tab, tabby socks. They were leather boots. The woman wasn't a woman at all. She was a Japanese soldier wearing a kimono over his uniform. A quick scan of the feet all around him found more army boots hidden among the kimonos. Japanese soldiers had snuck in among the ranks throughout the night hoping to slip through enemy lines with the refugees. Hideki scarped, excuse me, Hideki's heart skipped a beat. He was in trouble. They all were. When the American soldiers discovered there were Japanese soldiers hiding amongst them, the Americans would kill them all. <coughs> a 
But if he said anything now, raised the alarm, the Japanese soldiers would, were just as likely to kill them all as spies. Hideki slipped off the road, away from the refugees. He had walked straight with them for far too long. Evil was about to catch up to these people on both sides. Zigging and zagging, Hideki used the eerily illuminated Shiri Castle as a landmark and made his way farther south on his own. He thought again about the cave where Yoshio and Private Miyata and the old woman were, excuse me, where the old woman were. Were the Okinawans safe? Did Private Miyata still think the old woman was a spy? And what about Yoshio? How had he gone from being Hideki's worst enemy to Hideki's best friend? Not that he had come to Hideki's defense when Private Miyata went crazy, but what could Yoshio have done, really? What could any of the Okinawans do against Americans and Japanese? Hideki slid, slid to the bottom of a steep ravine, where a body lay half buried in the mud. Another star shell exploded overhead, and in the light, Hideki saw that the fallen soldier was an American. That was unusual. The Americans usually claimed their casualties as soon as they could, taking them away to treat them or bury them. It was the Japanese who couldn't come out. Excuse me. It was the Japanese who couldn't come out of their defense defensive bunkers to claim their dead. Hideki knelt by the body and went through the man's pack. There was food, and a photograph. A pretty woman wearing a dress and sitting on a beach. The smeared imprint of her red lips decorated the bottom corner of the photo. There were more American bodies nearby, and Hideki buried, hurriedly stuffed his own pack with as much food as he could find from theirs. He kept all the pictures he found, too, adding them to Ray's collection. Their collection now. A single shot rang out, Pakao! and the bullet flipped into the mud near Hideki. <gasps> a sniper. Hideki dove behind one of the bodies. The sniper didn't shoot again, but he knew where Hideki was. Hideki cursed himself for his stupidity. There was a reason the ravine were still full of American corpses. It was too dangerous to come out and get them. He must have wandered right into the no-man's land between the Americans on one side and the Japanese on the other. That meant that the slope behind him was occupied by the Imperial Japanese Army. If he could get to one of the caves inside it, he'd be safe. But if he stood, the American sniper would have a clear shot again. Hideki watched the star shell overhead growing dimmer and dimmer. He waited, his throat dry with anticipation, until the shell suddenly winked out and everything was pitch black again. Hideki leaped to his feet and ran up the hill, his bare feet slipping in the mud beneath him. For every meter he gained, he felt like he'd lost a half a meter sliding back down. Pikao! 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 Bullets flipped into the hillside around him. The American sniper couldn't see him, but he knew Hideki would be running in the, that darkness. Hideki climbed faster, his arms and legs scrambling to push him higher. Higher! Pikao! 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 More rifles joined the first. The American sentries were taking pot shots at him, hoping to hit him in the dark. Pa boom A battleship offshore fired another star shell. It whistled high into the air, leaving a glowing, green, white trail. Any second now, it would explode, the burning phosphorus lighting up the whole hillside. The American snipers would see him plain as day. Hideki's hand hit something wooden, a man-made ledge. Whoosh! The star shell burst overhead, and Hideki saw a small, open window cut into the hillside, just big enough for him to crawl through. And the Americans saw him. Hideki tossed his backpack into the hole as bullets, bullets shredded the wooden frame, then pulled himself through the window head first. He hit the rock floor inside with a thump, and scrambled back against the wall as bullets pinged through the opening. He licked his dry lips and panted hard, but at least he was still breathing. He'd made it. But where were the Japanese? The bunker was empty. If the Americans had been charging this hill for days and couldn't even come close enough to collect their dead, where were the Japanese soldiers with their rifles and machine guns and mortars? 
The American snipers stopped shooting. Hideki slipped away from the hole in the wall, staying out of their line of sight. He crawled through a narrow tunnel to a larger cavern beyond, where multiple levels had been cut out of the rock, but the whole place was completely empty. Where was everybody? Hideki got goosebumps walking through the empty bunker. This place should have been teeming with Japanese soldiers, and it looked like it had been until very recently. The floors were littered with abandoned ammunition boxes, scraps of bloody bandages, and empty rations, ration cans. But there were no people. Hideki wound his way through the tunnels to the opposite side of the hill, facing away from the American lines. There, another hole cut in the mountain framed the scene on the other side, showing him where everyone had gone. The Imperial Japanese Army was in full retreat. The roads south beyond the front lines were clogged with Japanese soldiers, all hurrying toward their next line of defense under the cover of dark and rain. When the Americans attacked the hill again tomorrow, they would meet no resistance. They would storm the bunker and find no one left inside, except for Hideki, unless he left right now. Hideki hiked Ray's backpack up on his shoulders, climbed through the hole, and ran. All right, next chapter is called Typhoon of Steel. A typhoon is a, is a storm, of course, okay? like, a, like a hurricane. Okay. Hideki made a rectangle with his fingers and squinted, framing the imaginary photograph. All around him, thousands of Okinawan refugees and Japanese soldiers trudged south in the pouring rain. The Japanese soldiers didn't even stop to go to the bathroom. They urinated as they jogged along the muddy highway. Wow, they must be in a hurry, huh? None of them willing to pause for even 30 seconds. They had to get to the next line of defensive caves before the Americans caught up. Hidden among them, Hideki was just one of tens of thousands of people clogging the roads. The highway would take them through Shikana and Ichi Nichi Bashi. And that's as far as Hideki needed to go. Ichinichi Bashi was where his sister would be. Hideki had never been this far south before. But wherever he was, it didn't look like Okinawa anymore. American bombs had knocked down trees and taken off the tops of hills. Wow. Stomping the landscape flat like an angry god. Entire villages were shattered. The wooden houses and barns reduced to toothpicks. There was no color to anything anymore. The people, the ground, the sky, they were all a dull, filthy, grayish brown. Like all the paints of an artist's palette had been swirled together in a muddy mess. This wasn't Okinawa, not the Okinawa that Hideki knew and loved. Hideki had used his fingers to frame what he was seeing in, the front, in front of him, the way the photographer had taught him. But now he did something different. Now he used the frame to imagine the way that Okinawa had been before the Americans had invaded, before the Japanese army had brought in cannons and built bunkers. He saw brilliant white coral sand roads lined with waving green palm trees, thatched wooden barns, square houses with red terracotta roofs, women in blue kimonos with babies strapped to their backs going to the market, old men in brown shirts and brown straw hats, leading water buffalo to sugarcane fields. Everywhere he looked, the bright memory of before overlaid the gray, gray, miserable after, like his fingers were making a window into the past. A past that was so recent, so real to him, that he could almost reach out and touch it. Something moved in the corner of Hideki's eye, and he glanced sideways, but nothing was there. I know, I know, he told the ghost of Ray. I'm sorry, I'm trying. Komoka will be able to help us. We just have to find her first. But how will I ever find her in all of this? Hideki wondered. An American fire plane came roaring right up behind the long line of people, like it was following the highway. It flew so low that Hideki could make out the face of the pilot. Everyone ducked and screamed, but the plane didn't shoot at them. 
It roared up into the sky and circled high above them for a few seconds before disappearing into the clouds. The Japanese soldiers among them shoved Hideki and the other Okinawans out of the way as they ran off in all directions, and Hideki suddenly understood. The plane was a spotter for the battleships offshore. It had probably already radioed in where the crowds were. Incoming! Get down! Hideki yelled. He dove off the road into a water-filled ditch as the first shell exploded right in the middle of the highway. The blast was deafening. Hideki felt his breath, excuse me, Hideki held his breath and put his head under the water. The muffled booms shook him and rocked the ground, and he squeezed his eyes shut and drew his arms and legs in tight. Mud and rock and shrapnel pelted him. His world was a hellfire and destruction for longer minutes than he could count, punctuated only by a quick gasps of air. At last the bombing stopped. Hideki waited under the water until his lungs burned so much he had to breathe, and he lifted himself up on his hands and his knees. The road was gone, and so was everyone who had been on it. Those who'd been outside the target area, those who had been spared, got to their feet and hurried on through the carnage, leaving the wounded behind. And Hideki, his, eye, his eyes dry and his heart hard, did the same. All right, that's chapter 31 and 32. I'll get it uploaded onto YouTube, and hopefully we'll get it to you maybe even by tonight, huh? All right, have a great day. Remember, school tomorrow... Uh, there's a language, IXL language assignment that's due tomorrow morning, right? Okay, I hope that there's more than just Becca, Callie, and Izzy that are listening to these, uh, these chapters each and every day. So, all right, have a great day. Get outside and play, everyone. Bye.